Uh, morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, this is our uh, reInvent recap webinar. Um, we'll just do a bit of housekeeping uh, to start with. Uh, so we've got um, this is a, a Zoom webinar, so you are uh, broadly unable to uh, interact with uh, with me other than through the uh, the Q and A button and the uh, and the chat button. So if you do have questions, do feel free to uh, to hit the Q and A button at the bottom of your Zoom window and type your question into there. I will either attempt to answer that question um, as I'm speaking, or I might defer it and ask. Um, Paul or Marco to to respond to that in the um, in in that uh, text form. Uh, Paul, Marco, uh, colleagues of mine, also on the call. I don't know if you can see them right now, but um, they are standing by to answer those questions. They've been uh, watching along reInvent with me as well. Um, so we're about as informed as each other, I think, for the most part. Bear in mind that a lot of the reInvent stuff that comes out, we hear about it at the same time that you do. So um, although we're probably paying a bit more attention in general uh, than you're able to, um, we, we're still sort of, um, you know, we, we don't have any sort of inside track on, on what's been going on, with the exception of like maybe one or two things where we've been working expressively with customers who are using early preview versions of things. Uh, we tend not to, to see what's going on. Um, I am recording this webinar um, and uh, I will make the slides available on our, uh, on our website later on so uh, don't feel obliged to take notes um do just uh, sit back and enjoy the dulcet tones of me with a bit of a cold um so i uh, managed to pick up at the weekend the first time leaving the house in about i don't know three months so yay go me um obviously we are at home uh, this is standard covid procedure um it is possible we'll be interrupted by the postman or you know my cardo delivery showing up early or something so please do bear with if that uh, if that happens um i will uh, just i'm right by the door so uh, there's no real uh, opportunity for other people to to uh, handle that on my behalf unfortunately um so we are recapping reInvent, um, as we've talked about. Uh, I guess the, the usual question at the beginning of a webinar is, you know, who's this guy talking? Um, those of you who don't know me, I'm John. Uh, I'm the founder, CEO, CTO of the Scale Factory. Uh, I've been doing things in the hosting and infrastructure space for about two decades. So, um, you know, I've seen, seen a lot of awful stuff come on. Um, I'm AWS certified at various levels, if, uh, if that's something that matters to you. Uh, my general sort of interests are infrastructure and AWS and, and DevOps. Um, as a business, the... Uh, the Scale Factory is a, an AWS consulting partner at the advanced tier. Um, this is an old slide, actually. I'm missing uh, missing our SaaS competency on there. We've we worked a lot with SaaS businesses over the last uh, last few years. And that's sort of our niche, really. Um, we also uh, we're Kubernetes certified service provider. So if you have Kubernetes problems and if you're using Kubernetes in production, you probably do. Uh, we can help with those. And uh, we're also listed on the G Cloud framework. So if you are um, a public sector buyer, you can uh, buy from us through that uh, that platform. I'd like to uh, share a picture of the team. Um, this is uh, not 100% accurate today. Um, we have new starters joining us uh, next year. So um, the uh, the team is growing. We are a, a growing business. Um, and uh, these are the friendly faces you'll deal with uh, day to day if, you've, uh, if you're have if you interacting with us. And uh, in terms of clients, we've worked across the, the board um, in you know lar larger businesses like Expedia and ITV that you probably recognize, um, but also sort of SME and startup uh, businesses across a range of, uh, of market sectors. Uh, including fintech and, and medtech, uh, you know, e-commerce, uh, that sort of thing. So, um, it's uh, we, we've we've had a, a sort of broad uh, history of, of working with customers. Um, next year, we're likely to be focusing much more um, solidly on the SaaS market, and particularly SaaS customers who have. Um, interesting security or compliance problem so that, that's the the messaging you're going to hear from us next year um but uh, we are of course happy to work uh, with other customers still as well um so what is reinvent uh, reinvent is the annual aws conference it's typically in vegas every year um obviously that's not happening this year for for clear reasons um which is a, a bit of a mixed blessing um Vegas is probably the worst place in America. I don't really like being there. I like being at reInvent um, and, and the sort of uh, opportunities for chatting to people uh, within AWS who are sort of maybe in the States usually and we don't get to see. Um, but uh, being in Vegas isn't a lot of fun. The other thing that's different this year is that uh, rather than reInvent being across sort of five days uh, in, in one week, um, reInvent online is now you know, multiple weeks of, uh, of content. So in, in initially sort of from 30th of November through to the 18th of December. So it's, it's nominally finishing on Friday, but recently uh, they announced they had another batch of, uh, of content to add um, between January the 12th and 14th. So um, it's, it's quite a hefty conference in person. There are about 60,000 people. Um, you know, I, I was one of them last year. This is my, I've just got off a plane face. Um, not very impressed by the looks of things queuing up for my swag. Um, 
and uh, the things that go on at reInvent typically are keynotes, so big, big uh, presentations by notable individuals from the AWS ecosystem um, and other sessions as well. So um, sessions from uh, engineers and partners and so forth on um, specific technologies or particular customer stories or, or so forth. What we're going to be concentrating on today is the uh, the launches and the announcements that came out of the out of the keynotes and the some of the smaller, less uh, sort of fan fed announcements that will maybe dropped in those other sessions. Uh, but we won't go into details of, of some of the other sessions that are running. If you're interested in in that, I've been posting a, 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 pick, a pick of the week sort of uh, list on Twitter at the beginning of uh, sorry the end of um, of every week um, I blogged about the uh, the, the first week uh, picks you can go and look at that now um, I haven't yet written a blog post about the the second week so there's there's lots of good content there um, and it's it's some of the uh, the clearest descriptions of, of how uh, the AWS services actually work that you'll probably find so it, it is worth poking around in that and uh, uh, and seeing what you can learn. I think that the team have learned quite a lot from that as well. It's a, it's a great resource. I, I believe that the reInvent content will ultimately end up on YouTube as it has in previous re years. But right now, the um, the, the sort of video on demand version of, of this content is currently uh, only available on the reInvent website that you have to sign up for and, and log into. So you'll need to, need to do that if you're interested in watching. So um, let's talk about the updates. Um, I've, I've sort of split today's um, stuff into multiple sections, kind of groupings that are nominally related to each other, just to uh, uh, you know basically get get things that are um, related in one place, uh, so that you you can kind of go, okay, we're talking about EC2 now. I'll, I'll tune out until we get to the storage stuff or whatever. So um, EC2 updates that we're, we're going to start with. Um, the biggest news and the first launch that came out of uh, reInvent this year uh, was the um, EC2 Mac instances. Um, so these are bare metal instances running uh, on Intel Mac hardware. Um, there will be ARM versions of these next year, um, but they are uh, fully specced um, Mac mini hardware um, running within the Nitro uh, hypervisor system, which I'm going to talk about in a, in a little bit, um, giving you sort of really good network performance and, and storage performance, just as you'd expect if you were using this in um, you know on, on your desktop itself. So. Um, the the use case here, I think, is if you're uh, building iOS applications um, and you are maybe currently you have a few of these uh, Mac Minis knocking around in a cupboard somewhere, um, or uh, maybe your your current application uh, notarization process and signing process is done maybe on the CTO's laptop. Uh, this would be a really good um, good way to get that properly into your CI pipeline and, um, uh, and and sort of be a bit more mature about how you're managing your keys and, and, and secrets for your, uh, your app delivery pipeline. Um, it is more expensive than buying a Mac mini for your cupboards um, over time. Um, but uh, you are, of course, taking advantage of the fact that all this is taken care of for you by AWS. And, and now that many of us are jettisoning our offices, um, we, uh, we're probably going to be leaning on these sort of things a little more. So that was interesting news. Um, and um, later on in the uh, in reInvent, Peter DeSantis uh, ran a keynote on infrastructure. He shared a, shared a photograph of, of what this looks like. This is actually a Mac mini, right? It's a Mac mini stuck in, a, in an Amazon EC2 chassis um you can't quite see there but the um the the mini itself is connected to um, some custom hardware from aws uh, called the nitro um over a pcie bus that you can see from the mac mini over thunderbolt 3 so this is they haven't really hacked the the mac hardware this is legit mac hardware um, i suspect there might be some changes to the bootloader and, and that sort of thing but this is um you know an, an actual mac mini plugged into uh into the nitro backplane if you like um just as any other piece of hardware in the aws ecosystem so i wanted to talk a little bit about nitro because nitro is interesting um and kind of cool and, and an area that you can dig into a bit more if you if you would like this is a, a lovely drawing from uh, it's a guy called jerry hargrove who's aws geek on uh, on twitter um, and he tends to draw these kind of um conference doodles based on uh on on things that come up in in the um in the aws 
conferences that he's been to. Um, and this shows the evolution of how EC2 has, has grown over time. Um, so in, initially, um, EC2 was was done using the Zen hypervisor. It was all in, in software. Um, that was about 2013. Looking forward through to, um, to 2017, uh, so not long ago at all, um, all of the things that the Zen hypervisor used to do are now provided by hardware. And that hardware is built by um, a, an AWS owned organization called Annapurna Labs, who are a, you know, a, a silicon design company. And those pieces of hardware um, are uh, separate chips that manage, or separate computers even, that manage uh, networking and storage uh, and management and, and security stuff. So um, today, um, all of the new instance types that you buy from AWS um, have their hypervisor um, facilities provided by this Nitro platform. Um, which gives you exceptional performance because all of this is in silicon, um, a really good solid security foundation um, because of how this uh, how, how these chips manage the uh, the instances that you that you run on, um, and added a, a lot of other sort of interesting features as well, like the Nitro uh, enclaves, which um, I don't think I'm talking about today, but because uh, they they weren't launched at reInvent, but there there's some good uh, there was a good talk from uh, Colin McArthur, um, who uh, who's one of the engineers on um, on the enclave. Uh, system uh, that you can have a look at. I think I've linked to that from my first blog on uh, on reInvent. Um, really interesting stuff. Allow you to run um, <clears throat> isolated uh, compute within a secure um, uh, compute environment <clears throat> with uh, with uh, the ability to to guarantee that the the data that that uh, compute environment sees can't be exported or or, uh, or tampered with. So uh, really worth a look if you're in a sort of high high regulatory space. Um, <clears throat> if you are interested in, in Nitro, I encourage you to go and uh, go and look more into it. Um, it's um, it is the foundation of how EC2 works, um, and uh, and this is kind of the edge that AWS have in their in their compute environment over the the other um, the other cloud providers. So I don't believe use uh, anything quite like this. The other thing that Annapurna Labs have, have done whilst they've been uh, part of AWS, um, which sort of leads directly on from Nitro, is um, they've built these uh, a, a chip called Graviton2. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and the Graviton2 chip is a um, it's an it's an ARM chip essentially, um, and they've this year launched um, four new types of instances based on Graviton2 um, within the same kind of class designations as the earlier Intel offerings. So um, M6G, for example, is uh, a general purpose uh, compute environment for sort of regular apps. We've also got T4G, which is burstable general purpose, C6G, which is the, for compute intensive apps, and R6G, which is memory intensive apps. The G is the thing that signifies that that's a Graviton instance, and that, that means that that is an ARM instance. Um, so why would you be looking at Graviton 2? Um, so these are custom silicon cores that, uh, that Annapurna Labs have, have built um, for AWS. Um, no one else is using um, using these uh, these chips as well as uh, being sort of based on a, on a well-known uh, Neoverse ARM core, um, a lot of the design of the chip has uh, taken into account specifically cloud native optimizations. Um, so uh, the way that uh, <clears throat> the way that the general purpose chip uh, works is such that it's, it's designed, you know, legitimately for, for general purpose. Um, Graviton 2 has been designed to optimize the things that cloud applications do most frequently. So um, one good example of this is that the, the level one cache um, is four times the size of, of, the, of traditional SMT chips um, because a lot of the, the things that your, your web applications are doing are making sort of small reads and writes to, to, uh, to memory. Uh, and so the, the additional cache there means that that's uh, massively optimized. Um, the M6G instance class is 20% cheaper than the M5 instance in sort of raw um, instance hour terms. Um, but actually, the, the way that the Graviton chip is built, because it has these um, these targeted optimizations, you get a 40% better price per performance uh, ratio. Um, and so looking at Graviton 2, if you can, as a, um, as a you know, team building software for the cloud um, is really worth doing because you'll probably save a bunch of money on it. Um, there was Peter DeSantis's uh, keynote covered the uh, some of the, the the facts and figures about Graviton too. So this is a benchmark um, for the Postgres HammerDB uh, benchmark, which shows in in this graph that the um, the performance 
of um, of the Graviton 2 instances continues to increase as the number of cores increase, whereas in the, the sort of M5 Intel world, that more or less sort of plateaus at 48 cores. Uh, Graviton is sort of carrying on in that direction. So uh, really worth looking at. Um, and in theory, um, if you're building, <clears throat> you know, a... a um, you know, either you're compiling your own sort of Go code or Rust code or whatever, um, or you are using an interpreted language, translating or, or sort of moving over to uh, to Graviton should be relatively straightforward. I'm not saying it's going to be uh, dead simple, but if you've got a good test suite and a good um, good CI pipeline, then you could relatively easily add another sort of leg to your CI runs to uh, incorporate the Graviton hardware um, and uh, get to the point where you could phase out your uh, some of your Intel stuff and, and potentially save up to 40% on your workload. So um, definitely worth considering. <clears throat> there are some other uh, EC2 instances released uh, this this time around. So there's the D3 instances, which provide a high local storage capacity of up to 336 terabytes, which seems absolutely ludicrous to me. Um, the uh, M5ZN instances are um, high frequency, high speed, low network latency uh, instances for running simulations or gaming. Uh, the R5B uh, instance class provides a higher EBS um, your storage performance. So those are designed for things like database workloads and ERP systems. Um, G4 AD instances are, uh, they provided a, uh, in this case, a Radeon Pro V520 GPU. Um, so you may, may use those for sort of streaming games or uh, or for training your ML models, but more on ML later, um, including um, the fact that they, they have launched a Habana Gaudi accelerated instance, which um, I know literally nothing about, um, but is, uh, is essentially a, an, an ML um, accelerator, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, that's not really an area I know a lot about, as I will be confessing in more detail when we get to the ML section. So that's compute. Um, let's move on and have a look at storage. Uh, more opportunities for cost saving here in, in the storage realm. Um, so you may be familiar with uh, the EBS GP2 storage type. That's uh, that's what you're most likely to be using right now. Um, Amazon have released uh, EBS GP3. Uh, that's available right now. Um, it's 20% cheaper than GP2 by raw um, you know, gigab uh, gigabyte month cost. Um, the maximum performance is also four times that of, uh, of GP2. Um, and, and crucially, uh, in the GP3 world, the uh, the performance of your uh, of your volume doesn't relate to the capacity. So in GP2, you would often find that if you needed a certain number of IOPS, um, because you've got more IOPS per uh, more gigabytes, uh, you would sometimes be sizing your storage volumes much bigger than you needed to in order to get the performance you needed. Um, that goes away with GP3. You can now get uh, 3,000 IOPS and 125 megabytes a second at any volume size, um, and that's in the sort of base cost, and you can pay extra to scale that up uh, up to uh, 16,000 IOPS and uh, 1,000 mega megabytes a second. So um, that sort of the change in relationship between uh, performance and capacity is probably one of the things that might might cause you to save money. Um, and if that doesn't, then the fact that this is actually cheaper storage would uh, would probably do that. So um, do consider um, moving your your GP2 to uh, to GP3 volumes. Um, the uh, you can change those in place. So if you go into the console or you're using Terraform to update the, the volume type, um, that will uh, get changed underneath your application. Um, there's obviously a performance impediment to doing that, so don't run that in Terraform across all your instances uh, because you'll be in terrible trouble uh, performance-wise. But uh, you know, one at a time, you can fairly easily switch those over. And there doesn't seem to be a good reason not to. Um, the, the, um, there was a briefly uh, on release, GP3 volumes were not compatible as root volumes. That was a bug that got fixed. Um, and today, it's worth noting that um, some of this sort of um, volume uh, capacity management versus uh, performance stuff has been most relevant to users of RDS. Um, GP3 is not yet available to RDS, but I would expect to see that next year. Um, so do keep an eye on that. But again, uh, this is a way that you could save some money reasonably easily um, with your uh, with your running apps today. Another uh, storage announcement uh, was IoT Block Express EBS, which is a terrible, terrible name. Um, this is uh, a, I think, in, in preview or a, a sort of future announcement. Um, the IoT Block Express basically provides SAN-like performance for um, for EBS. So um, it's underpinned by Nitro, which is why they get the, the sort of performance we're talking about here. Um, it's currently in preview, um, but the, uh, the 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 story here is that if you if you 
would in your on-premises environment have a SAN backing a number of applications. This is probably the analog when you do your migration into the cloud. So for cloud native apps, probably not as uh, as relevant because uh, we tend not to deal with things like multi-attached storage and um, you know IO fencing and that sort of thing. But for enterprise applications, that's uh, maybe uh, maybe a little bit less avoidable. So um, the uh, this is probably useful for people that maybe aren't you. <laughs> I guess is probably the best way of looking at it. Um, S3 got some updates this year as well. Um, the the big one, um, which is actually a small one, um, and I, I blogged about why, um, the addition of strong read after write consistency to S3. So it used to be the case that if you were to um, if you were to update an existing S3 object and then try and read it back, you wouldn't necessarily get the updated version that you've just written. Um, that is now actually um, fixed. So um, S3 now is strongly read after write consistent everywhere, um, which must be an, an absolutely staggering amount of engineering uh, to, to get to that point. Um, Werner's keynote yesterday, uh, he talked a bit about how they achieved that. Uh, S3 is an enormous distributed system. Um, and in order to, to make these changes safely, on you know S3 while it's running without causing any um, any impediments to uh, to operation, um, they did a lot of um, formal modeling analysis of the um, of the, the components um, and uh, and used uh, automated reasoning tools to uh, essentially enumerate all of the potential states for all of the components of the um, of this distributed system uh, to demonstrate that they hadn't broken it. So really significant um, engineering efforts. Um, all undertaken by people that you've never seen before to solve problems that you probably didn't really know, know that you had. Um, and uh, and that, that for me is a real strong example of why cloud is such a thing. Um, the, uh, the the fact that you you probably, that if, if you had assumed that S3 behaves like a file system, you'd have been right most of the time, but you'd occasionally get these sort of edge cases where that wasn't true. It is now true. Um, and so uh, you haven't had to do anything to, uh, to solve that, which is pretty impressive stuff. Other other change to S3, uh, one of uh, security. So it used to be the case that if you were um, encrypting objects onto S3 uh, as you wrote them, uh, S3 would be making calls to KMS to get keys uh, for each object written. Um, that was quite time consuming, expensive, and um, uh, a little bit unperformant. So today, um, S3 now uses a, a bucket key in, encryption model. So S3 itself manages keys on a per object basis and goes to KMS to get just one key to see or derive those other keys. So um, again, another sort of quiet thing that you probably don't, won't really notice, but uh, but sort of massively improves uh, life for you and probably reduces cost because you're not hitting KMS quite as frequently. Uh, so if you've got a very heavy encrypted S3 workload, then that, uh, that may well already be saving you money. Um, unless unless you have to do something to turn it on, I'm actually not sure. Uh, we should probably check on that. Um, container landscape is uh, is also worth talking about. Obviously, a lot of you are building applications on uh, containerized platforms of some sort. Um, one uh, announcement that we were expecting because I think Amazon teased this. Uh, as Docker Hub was closing down its anonymous access, um, you can now uh, using Elastic Container Registry publish uh, public and anonymously accessed um, containers yourself uh, using that that tool. So uh, if you were previously shipping software in Docker Hub, you can now move that over to, to ECR public and your, uh, your customers will still be able to get at those. So maybe relevant, may not be. Um, the uh, ECR public is published through Cloudflare, uh, sorry, CloudFront. So it's obviously um, as performant and available as, as, as CloudFront is. Um, and uh, in addition to, to those changes, um, this isn't strictly an ECR public change, but it is a, an ECR change. Um, you can now replicate your ECR um, registries between regions. So if you've been uh, doing that sort of thing manually or with uh, with lambdas and so forth as, as we definitely have for, for some of the work we've done this year um, that's now taken care of by aws for you um so your your container registries can be synchronized into other regions with ease uh, for easing your either disaster recovery situation or your um you know, pro proximity uh, question about where you store your images um other things, this is pretty interesting. I think um, ECS Anywhere and EKS Anywhere. So ECS is the uh, a container orchestrator. Uh, EKS is the Kubernetes service on AWS. 
um, the ECS Anywhere and EKS Anywhere model will allow you in future, it's not yet available fully, uh, to run your container workloads um, on your own hardware, you know, whatever that hardware is, Raspberry Pis and your, you know, your back office or, um, or your VMware clusters in your data center or whatever, um, using the uh, the control plane for ECS and EKS still running in, in the AWS cloud. So um, you're essentially saying that you're going to run your ECS or EKS clusters centrally from AWS, but with the compute happening uh, in your own data center. Um, so this obviously has benefits in that um, you don't then have to run that control plane yourself, which is you know often hard work and uh, people do badly and, and uh, fail to patch things and so forth. Um, and uh, the guarantee is that none of your customer data is going to leave that network. So um, if you're in a sort of compliance or banking environment or, or um, you have particular security concerns, then um, running a control plane from the cloud, but keeping your data in your own premises is is a thing that you might want to want to look at. So that's pretty interesting. I think it's uh, it's going to drive um, probably migration stories for a number of, uh, of businesses. I can see um, you know companies who are maybe a little cloud shy still um, standing up an EKS anywhere to, uh, to to tinker with it on their on their own hardware and then realize the benefits of having someone else do a lot of the hard work for you and then move the actual compute into the cloud as well. So um, interesting times. Um, in order to support that, there is also the Amazon EKS distro, which I believe is available right now um, it's a kubernetes distribution um, which is the the distribution that is used by eks essentially um, it's aligned with the amazon eks version lifecycle policy so um, the the versions that will get security updates and so forth is, is the same as uh, the eks product itself um, and it is of course open source um, and it's uh, available on, on github right now if you're interested in having a look at that so um, if you are running that sort of hybrid model where you've got some cloud stuff and some on-prem stuff this might be a great way of um, rationalizing your kubernetes deployment so that you have a um, a, a single view of uh, of how uh, kubernetes is run in your organization that ultimately you can give a lot of the hard work to amazon to do for you in addition, uh, EKS now provides a set of add-ons. Uh, these are um, a, a mechanism for configuring and deploying additional Kubernetes pieces of software using the AWS APIs. So as you provision your EKS clusters, for example, um, being able to add the VPC uh, container networking interface and, and other bits and pieces um, is, uh, is something that you can do as you deploy it with CloudFormation or, or Terraform and so forth. So bootstrapping a cluster becomes a bit less troublesome. Um, and there are the support for IAM roles for service accounts there as well. So deeper integration with uh, with the IAM um, security policies uh, for your Kubernetes deployment. So that's definitely worth worth looking at. If, you, if you're finding yourself currently standing up Kubernetes using uh, Terraform and then going at the uh, the Kubernetes API with uh, with your configuration of things like the CNI, um, then this is probably going to save you a bit of pain. Um, and of course, the uh, the guarantee is that the Amazon will keep those working for you. Um, so not only are they taking some effort away, um, they're taking that effort away in perpetuity, which is, of course, what the cloud is all about. Um, that's enough uh, container stuff. Uh, let's look at the serverless updates. Um, one notable thing, um, this sort of leaked ahead of uh, reInvent because people noticed it in their billing console. Um, AWS Lambda is now billed in one millisecond granularity. So that used to be by the 100 millisecond. Uh, you'll now build for every millisecond. Um, so round it down rather than round it up. Um, that might save you some money. I wouldn't worry too much about massively optimizing for that uh, if I were you, but uh, your, your billing is going to look a little bit different. So don't be surprised if, you're, um, if your finance people wonder what the hell's going on. This is a pretty interesting um, development as well. I think this is... Um, Something that I was I was surprised when AWS released Lambda not to see them providing the uh, the sort of packaging format as container uh, images. Um, so this is what two or three years in um, they've they've solved that problem now. So you can now um, build your Lambda functions as containers. So if you are running a containerized workload for on e e ECS or EKS or, or Fargate. Um, you might be building uh, building containers to run in your production environment. You might today be currently running a few lambdas alongside it in zip, building zip files in the way that you have to with with Lambda previously. Um, today, you can now use the uh, container tooling to build a, a, a Lambda um, 
based on the uh, the base images uh, that AWS provide for all the supported Lambda runtimes. Uh, there's also a Lambda runtime interface emulator, which allows you to uh, to run the um, the container in the way that Lambda would invoke it. So you can sort of test that locally or in your local development. Uh, you can uh, have parity with how that's going to be invoked. Um, and of course, that also means then that your Lambda containers are also going to be published into ECR. So I can see a, um, a good argument for aligning all of your um, compute image builds, um, you know, your, your container images and your and your Lambda images through a, uh, the same CI pipeline, essentially, um, and, uh, uh, and publishing that into ECR so that uh, your code could run as Lambda or it could be run as, as a, a container depending on how it's invoked. I think that's uh, that's pretty powerful. So uh, definitely worth uh, worth looking into. Um, fully feature compatible with existing Lambda. There's no no sort of weird, uh, weird, wonderful stuff here that the uh, hooks for, um, for um, function monitoring and all that kind of stuff are, are still available in, in this format. So um, do give it a try. I think that's, uh, that's going to save you a bunch of effort because I think your CI pipelines will then become quite, um, you know, uh, homogenous, uh, if you like. Also in the serverless realm, um, I know a lot of people think of sort of Aurora as, as database rather than serverless, but actually Aurora serverless is a serverless um, uh, service on the basis that you yourself are not provisioning compute and, and making sort of scaling decisions and that sort of thing. Um, serverless, Aurora serverless version one, um, it's designed for um, for variable workloads where um you maybe don't you can't predict it in advance right you don't know what the the general sort of baseline performance is um really good for sort of SaaS business models where you've maybe sold um a per customer or per tenant database and not all the tenants are using their databases all the time so while they're not using that um things are uh, not not running and, and not being built um so really great for that work type of workload but um v1 has some issues around cold cold starting and scale so um as you as you make your first request of aurora serverless v1 um that can sometimes take around 10 to 30 seconds to, to properly warm up and that that rules it out for certain types of workload um, and on scale events uh serverless aurora serverless v1 um doubles the amount of capacity on every scale up so you start with uh you know a certain number of, of compute units and then they double and they double and they double um and uh and that means that you're you're potentially often paying for capacity you're not actually using so uh, aurora serverless v2 solves that um it's currently in preview for uh, aurora mysql um postgres support is is planned for next year um it scales out faster so that cold start problem not there anymore um, and it scales more granularly, so it adds individual compute units rather than doubling every time, uh, which uh, which is going to be probably uh, save you a bunch of money. Um, and still, it's it's great for variable or SaaS workloads. You can see that it's being used for you know dev environments to get used sometimes. Um, it's uh, it's worth looking at the economics of uh, of Aurora Serverless versus Aurora. That there are if if you're using Aurora Serverless at you know, sort of 100% utilization, it's definitely going to be more expensive than a regular Aurora platform. But if you don't, uh, on if you don't currently know your uh, scaling characteristics or um, or your workload is inconsistent, uh, Aurora Serverless is, is worth a look on that that score. And as V2 becomes available, um, it will probably save you some money and, and work a little better for you. So do, do keep an eye out for that. So I've called this question, this section DevOps updates um, against my better nature. These are sort of things to do with operations and, and monitoring, really. Um, so let's uh, let's get into those. Um, the first sort of most notable release in this kind of uh, area is uh, AWS Proton. Now, I haven't looked at in great detail at this, um, but it looks to be a, a mechanism for uh, providing platform teams a um, tooling to present to their uh, developers a way of self-serving their application deployments in a consistent way. So your platform team can define the standards for deployment, maybe uh, the security boundaries and the, the guardrails and so forth, um, and then provide that mechanism to developers to release their uh, their, their container workloads and their, their Lambda workloads, um, all using infrastructure as code, which, uh, as you know, in the Amazon world is, uh, you know, code for this is cloud formation sorry um so uh might be worth a look i, I think uh, i'd like to poke it a little more it feels to me like it sits in a similar space to uh, the hashicorp waypoint product that was released this year as well um so the, there's a lot of sort of thinking around uh, how to 
basically remove the, uh, the the sort of undifferentiated hard work of helping teams self-serve deploy their microservices environments, that, that sort of thing. So uh, probably worth a look. I'm definitely going to be reading a bit more about it. Um, it's uh, my, my experience of Amazon's kind of higher level products like this, the ones that glue other things together is that they're either great or they're terrible. There's no real sort of middle ground. So um, be interesting to see which of uh, which of those Proton is, um, but definitely, uh, definitely interested to play with that. Um, the unfortunately named DevOps Guru. Um, this is a similar service to Guard Duty, if you're if you're familiar with Guard Duty, uh, in that it is a, an ML-powered operations service, um, and the the machine learning aspect of this is used to keep an eye on your um, operational data. So things like your CloudWatch um, uh, metrics and logs. Uh, your Amazon config, so your AWS config setups, uh, your cloud trail logs, and your X-ray traces, um, and looking at looking at those to to raise alarms when there are anomalies. So, uh, in the example that they've used to to demonstrate this on the uh, on the blog, there's um, things like the number of errors that come out of your RDS database, for example. That's that's probably a relatively consistent number until something's going wrong, um, at, at which point DevOps Guru is going to surface that via um, you know an SNS uh, publication. So probably into your Slack or your PagerDuty if you've uh, integrated it that way, maybe into a ticketing system if you're uh, living in that particular hellscape. Um, and the, uh, the idea there is that um, DevOps Guru is alerting you to things that might be about to go wrong um, by looking for things that are anomalous. So um, probably really easy to turn on um, in the same way that guard duty is. Um, there's no real reason not to use it. Um, you know, go turn it on, see what it tells you about your, your platform. Probably don't wire it straight to page of duty uh, on day one because uh, you might uh, wake some people up and, and upset them. But uh, I think uh, definitely worth a, worth a look. The, this for me is the type of ML product that is interesting. I think that the um, Amazon's landscape of, of ML products are either the things that you use to build your own ML stuff with your models and your uh, your inferences and what have you um, versus the things that have been built on top of machine learning tooling. Um, and the latter to me is much more interesting because that's Amazon applying um, machine learning stuff to make your life a bit easier. Uh, and the fact that they have access to huge amounts of data about how other people's platforms are running can then inform you how you run your platform and help you be a, you know, a little bit better, a little bit more informed about how things are running. So um, definitely worth looking at. Uh, another interesting tool. Um, this one is uh, driven by automated reasoning. So uh, if you are interested in how uh, Amazon build some of this sort of tooling, uh, Werner Vogel's keynote from yesterday covers this in a, in a bit of detail. Um, but the, the VPC reachability and analyzer allows you to use automated reasoning to, uh, to, to ask questions of your network setup um, to say, can this particular endpoint reach this other endpoint? And that'll take into account things like your, um, I think your, your load balancers and your uh, transit gateways and, and your VPC peering relationships and everything else. Um, and just looking at the config and, and telling you things uh, about how your network is set up. So in part, that's you know, troubleshooting. So if, if you think you should be able to pass traffic between two locations and you're, you're failing to do so, then Reachability Analyzer will probably tell you that. But also from a security and, and compliance perspective, you could use Reachability Analyzer to, um, to assert that it is not possible for certain traffic flows to take place, um, which is probably quite a, quite a powerful thing in that, that sort of security landscape. Another distribution uh, that's been open sourced recently is the AWS distro for open telemetry. Um, so open telemetry is a, a CNCF project that uh, aims to standardize uh, tracing data essentially. So op open telemetry is uh, compatible, I believe with things like Prometheus and uh, X-Ray um, and I think so, some vendor products as well. So things like Datadog and Honeycomb and so forth. Um, this is a distribution of that set of tooling uh, supported by AWS and, uh, and provided as an open source uh, tool um, currently on GitHub, I believe. Um, so uh, worth, uh, worth poking around at if you are looking at getting into tracing in, in more detail. Again, yesterday uh, released uh, the AWS Fault Injection Simulator. This is a, uh, a tool, I think this is in preview, um, for managed chaos engineering, which is to say um, the, the sort of 
uh, formation of hypotheses about how your platform will respond to particular adverse events, um, and then the introduction of a simulated version of that adverse event, so that you can uh, you can see whether your hypothesis about how how well you can deal with that uh, will hold. So um, the intent is that you'd use this to, to run game days so you maybe sort of sit with your your team and and uh, game out the um the the way that uh, the a failure might impact on you and then use the uh, the tooling to uh, to generate that um that failure and uh, and see what happens um you can integrate it in your ci pipeline so that it, this is part of your sort of continuous um uh you know continuous checking of of, of how you handle handle faults um, the the other thing that uh, that this gives you over and above, for example, the you know Gremlin tooling or the uh, the Netflix tooling, um, is that it integrates well with CloudWatch and so forth. So if you're running some kind of chaos engineering experiment, you can configure it to automatically back off if you start seeing problems that that are actually production affecting problems uh, in your environment as it's running. So um, this uh, probably a, a, a really interesting tool. I think I, I, I don't think uh, a lot of teams are doing a lot of this sort of thing. Certainly our well architecture reviews don't uh, don't suggest that there's a lot of this going on. Um, and so I think this is going to be a, a really interesting thing to to look at next year and and probably we will look at um you know, building some kind of consultancy offering around it to help teams get the best out of it so, um, uh, interesting stuff that not a lot of people are doing at this point talk briefly about managed services um so as a company we used to build um things like prometheus uh infrastructure for people or uh, you know open ldap um platforms for authentication and so forth over time um almost everything we were building uh became an amazon service and uh, the same is true this week uh so uh, amazon mq this actually this was mentioned in in one of the uh, the comms about reinvent but i'm pretty sure it was released earlier in the year but i think um some of the things that were released sort of april may time this year have been re-released at reinvent because we were all a little distracted in april and may and we maybe didn't notice these things happening so um there is now a a managed service for uh active mq or for rabbit mq so if you're currently on aws and you're running one of these brokers yourselves um and you are you know, not able to use sqs for some reason uh then moving over to amazon mq uh, as a service will reduce the amount of stuff that you have to manage yourself which is always uh, always beneficial um we also as of this week have an amazon managed service for prometheus um so that auto scales with uh, uh throughputs it's highly available across multiple az's um, and integrates deeply with iam for for permissions and so forth so if you are currently running prometheus and we know a lot of our customers are um then uh, adopting a, the amazon managed service is again going to save you a bunch of time and energy um if not money um i think they typically typically when these sort of things are released uh, there's a lot of um blowhards on twitter and uh, and hacker news complaining about how expensive this is typically these are people who are not thinking about uh, the manpower that goes into operating a, um, a service like this and and generally not really comparing the um you know, the, the high availability and auto scaling stuff versus you know the they're running prometheus on one server that's been manually configured kind of thing so um the these sort of services will often look expensive at first blush but actually um have a uh you know total cost of ownership which is lower than running your own platforms generally speaking um and likewise if you're using prometheus you're probably using grafana to provide the uh, the graphing uh, and uh, interrogation facilities that you that you need to get the most out of that data um and uh, so there's a managed service for that um and that integrates well with AWS SSO. So if your um, if your users log into uh, the AWS platform using their Active Directory uh, credentials or their their Google uh, Auth login, um, then uh, Grafana is all authenticated that way as well. Um, and it's easy to, easy to migrate to from a self managed Grafana. You can just pick up the dashboards and import them into the new service. So um, if you are using Prometheus and Grafana, you should definitely be looking at adopting this, uh, saving yourself some time and energy in future. Right, ML. Um, I know almost nothing about machine learning. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I sort of poked around, poke around the edges occasionally just to sort of see what language is being used and what what the use cases are. Um, machine learning, as far as I'm concerned, is the thing that uh, 
ha- having seen me buy a television on Amazon is now suggesting that I might like to buy a television. Um, so I put a lot of stock in, uh, in machine learning. The idea that it's going to be used to drive to manage self-driving cars is absolutely horrifying to me, frankly. But uh, if you are a, a team that's doing things with machine learning, uh, you might be interested to learn that uh, AWS have uh, have built some custom silicon. Again, like the uh, uh, Graviton 2 instances, this is uh, custom silicon built by Annapurna Labs for AWS themselves. Um, Trainium provides uh, custom ML training silicon. Uh, there are apparently lots of teraflops available, um, making this the most cost-effective training solution um, for your machine learning uh, workload. So um, if that means something to you, great. Uh, if not, let's move on. Um, SageMaker is the uh, the sort of suite of tools around building machine learning models. Um, and it got an absolute truckload of, uh, of new what they call products i'm pretty sure these are features rather than products to be fair um but um the the this year there was a dedicated machine learning uh keynote that i sat through uh, even though i usually you know don't really enjoy the uh, the machine learning bits of the main keynote um but the, the it's very clear this is a fast moving uh part of uh, of the ecosystem so if you are um, if you're building machine learning uh, models using SageMaker, you now have access to pipelines, which is uh, essentially CI tooling for your uh, for your ML models. Uh, you have access to Data Wrangler, which is a way of automating your data prep uh, ready for uh, for processing by your your models. Uh, there's a thing called Feature Store, which provides a consistent set of features across your organization during training and inference. Um, and uh, SageMaker will also uh, now run distributed training for uh, for large models such as t5 3b which sounds a little bit like a terminator sequel that should never have happened uh, which I, I believe is a um, some uh, vision vision type uh, thing which is needs needs to be highly parallelized and up until recently you couldn't do that with SageMaker. today you can uh, you can now parallelize those models across uh, uh, across SageMaker itself um, there's also uh, SageMaker edge manager which is about running your models uh, on the edge, so um, being able to uh, put your models and use them in devices that are maybe sat next to your manufacturing lines uh, or, or other sort of things near to where you generate your data rather than in the cloud. Um, and there was all the, there was a bunch of things uh, that were added around this uh, about sort of um, you know watching machinery for failure modes and uh some computer vision stuff for watching your uh, your manufacturing pipeline stuff i haven't included an update on this if you're if you're interested in in ml at all then the ml keynote will definitely uh, answer a lot of those questions uh stage maker debugger so that you can debug your uh, your models stage maker clarify which um seems like a, a a useful and worthwhile thing uh which is used to detect bias in your machine learning models um the uh the the keynote section on this um talked a lot about um you know biased decision making in mortgage applications and financial fraud um but i think we all know that this is kind of about not being massively racist <laughs> essentially um and the 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 keynote speaker for this section was a, a black woman who, who managed to you know entirely not mention systemic racism or, or anything of that nature during her her discussion but uh, that's clearly what this is for um, and if you're if you're building uh, machine learning systems and you're not thinking about bias then you're probably doing something evil whether you uh, whether you mean to or not so do do consider that um and sage make a jump start which is um seems to be a kind of uh, i think a, a training program to to get you um, uh, up to speed in uh, in ML things. Um, so lots of SageMaker updates. Very very little of that means much to me, but um, if you are into ML things, then uh, then that might be of interest to you. Um, the other thing that I I think is notable because it represents a trend um, is that uh, earlier in the year, um, Amazon released Amazon Aurora ML, which allows you to run your uh, run your models on data that exists in Amazon Aurora. Uh, and the, uh, the the keynote this time around, uh, they announced uh, Redshift ML and Neptune ML, which allows you uh, to point your machine learning models respectively at Redshift and, and Neptune. So there's a real trend here about getting machine learning close to where your data lives. So traditionally, you would normally have to export your data from these sort of services 
change its shape, put it somewhere specific in order to run uh, ML workloads against it. Um, this is obviously a, a, a trend to say, you know what, the, let's just take the ML to where your data lives. And I, I think that's a really positive thing. Um, it's like to, to lower the barrier to entry for you just to try something out on your data set. So um, no doubt it's worth, uh, worth looking into if, uh, if you're currently, you know, if you, if you currently ETL your data out of these services and into something so that you can run um, ML workloads across it, this might save you a bunch of time and energy. Um, other updates. So this is a, a collection of things that don't really fit in any of the other categories that um, I've just sort of pulled together because they were notable or interesting for some reason. Um, so a bunch of changes to AWS Glue, which is the uh, the ETL service for moving data around between uh, other services. Um, AWS Glue Data Brew was released at reInvent. Um, that is a tool for visual data preparation. So if you've got analysts or data scientists who are uh, typically spending time uh, cleaning and normalizing data, um, this is a, a, a tool to make that easier for them in a, in a GUI kind of way. Um, and uh, Glue Elastic Views, this is one of those things that sounds really easy to say, but it's probably actually a massive pile of engineering behind the, the scenes. Um, this is providing with Glue with a materialized view um, over multiple other data sources. So providing a, a materialized view over DynamoDB, Redshift, S3, Elasticsearch, and more in future. So um, this is an, another great example of stuff that Amazon are doing because lots of people have this pain point um, and, uh, and, and this will solve a bunch of problems for, for people. Um, and again, it's, it's about sort of taking the, um, taking the work to the data rather than the other way around, which uh, I think is uh, uh, a, a, a general trend that I've seen this year at reInvent. SAS Boost is worth uh, mentioning, uh, if only because we are part of the SAS competency program at AWS. Um, SAS Boost is a, um, it's described as a ready to use reference environment. So if, if you today are um, building software that is fairly monolithic and you're reasonably easily containerized and you may be selling that in a shrink wrap kind of way into enterprises or, or, or so forth, if you're a sort of ISV or, a, or a, an older school SaaS business, um, SaaS Boost will let you take that monolithic application, put it in a container definition and wrap it in um, a, a set of tooling to uh, handle deployment automation, analytics, billing, and metering. So um, if, you've, if you've traditionally sold shrink wrap software, this is a way to quickly get it into a SaaS model in the cloud <coughs> with Amazon taking care of a lot of the sort of um, the common things that you need to do when you're building a SaaS solution. They're pitching it as a starting point rather than a sort of you know, final uh, resting point for your, your applications. But if you are thinking about um, taking an existing sort of single tenant monolith and deploying it in a SaaS model uh, in a maybe sort of automated or automatically purchased way uh, for customers, then uh, then this is probably worth a look. Um, it's, a, it's fairly early on. I saw a preview of this a couple of weeks ago. Um, it looks like it solves some useful problems, um, maybe not relevant to you, but probably relevant to some people. Um, also, if you are in the sort of um, in the SaaS landscape, if you're currently a um, uh, an Amazon technology partner. Um, there are a couple of other interesting things. So um, they've launched an ISV partner path. So um, a, a set of documentation and, uh, and materials for helping you uh, engage more clearly with AWS for co-selling opportunities and, and so forth. Uh, and there's also now a, um, what they call a foundational technical review lens for the well-architected tool. Um, if you are a, an Amazon technology partner and you want to sell on the Amazon marketplace, you need to uh, to have a technical baseline review performed. Uh, traditionally, that was something that uh, an Amazon solutions architect would do for you. Um, we've actually been doing those in a sort of you know side way with uh, with the people from that team because we we knew that was going to uh, be shared with partners ultimately. The foundational technical review lens for well architected is ex essentially the technical baseline review. So um, if you are in the process of uh, of becoming a technology partner with Amazon and you are planning to to get a technical baseline review run, we can do that for you under under our well architected relationship. So do get in touch if that's that is of interest to you. Uh, but that's all sort of ISV and SaaS stuff that uh, that may well be um, worth knowing about. Some other stuff, um, Amazon Health Lake, uh, the very specifically targeted uh, service around uh, um, managing health and medical data for uh, for people. So this is a HIPAA eligible service. So <clears throat> it's obviously uh, passing all those uh, 
lovely security bars that need to be uh, need to be passed for that to be relevant. Um, they run uh, HealthLight can run NLP and medical comprehension and do ontology mapping and other things that uh, may be familiar terms if you are uh, from the the health landscape. I can see a couple of names in the uh, in the in the sign up list of uh, people who who work in that in that space, which is why I include this as potentially interesting. Um, so uh, that will help organise and index and structure patient information, which is traditionally quite sprawling and, and difficult to, to to deal with so might be worth a look if you are in the uh, in the medtech space uh, i'm not sure if that's fully available yet or if that's in preview uh, but do get in touch if uh, if you'd like to know more about that we can point you in the right direction uh, other things interesting in the sort of uh, compliance space um, is aws audit manager um, this is a tool to uh, allow you to map your AWS usage to your audit controls and to automatically collect evidence about um, how you are performing those controls. Um, there's a bunch of tooling around uh, allowing stakeholders to review your controls and generating uh, audit reports with, with less effort. So this seems really relevant to, uh, to people in the, in the health tech space or, uh, or maybe in the, in the financial services space. I haven't dug too far into this, but um, it seems like it, it answers a real kind of user need for um, for customers that we've seen in this sort of general area. So definitely interested to uh, to get into that with you if uh, if you're interested in in learning more. Um, and um, the awfully named um, launches of AWS Systems Manager, Change Manager, and AWS Systems Manager Fleet Manager um, also released uh, this week. Um, I uh, I'm not 100% sure what this uh, what this is, um, but it seems to be relevant if you are living in a pre DevOps change advisory board hellscape. Um, so if you are you're following you know ITIL v4 processes and uh, uh, and you sort of have a have a lot of kind of um, you know, systems for orchestrating change that involve manual sign-offs and that sort of thing. Uh, this seems like the the sort of thing you might want to look at. Uh, it sounds horrifying to me, but uh, I'm sure uh, doing it this way is is much nicer than using ServiceNow or any of the other uh, other incumbents in that area. So, um, if you are uh, still living in a cab world, um, maybe have a look at this, uh, or maybe have a look at getting shut of your cab. Data has demonstrated that um, those sorts of approaches slow things down rather than uh, improve matters. So uh, probably worth getting shut off, to be honest. Um, and the uh, couple of final things that I found uh, interesting this year, uh, Babelfish for Aurora Postgres. Um, if you're currently running an application that talks to SQL Server, um, this might be of interest to you. Um, Babelfish allows you to have your SQL Server talk to it and it talk to Postgres or at least Aurora Postgres, um, and uh, essentially allow you to stop paying Microsoft for your SQL Server licenses uh, because it translates the T-SQL that, uh, that your applications are using to talk to SQL Server into uh, Postgres commands. Um, and so if you are running uh, applications that use SQL Server 2014 or later, um, then you could have a look at that as a way to, uh, to get off your uh, Microsoft licensing uh, relationship. Uh, they're going to open source that soon, uh, is my understanding. Um, that will be hosted on GitHub, which of course is owned by Microsoft, which gives me a little giggle. Um, but uh, if you are keen to get off of a, a, a SQL Server license relationship, then uh, this is something you should be looking at. Um, and I, I, there's, a, there's a bit of a trend of this going on as well. Um, I think uh, we could probably expect to see something Oracle related in this space as well in time. So um, definitely worth looking at for those of you using SQL Server. Currently, you'll probably save a bunch of cash uh, and maybe improve your performance as well. Um, and uh, the final thing that uh, was released yesterday that we uh, we were having a look at this morning, uh, Cloud Shell, um, not to be confused with either Google Cloud Shell, which hasn't got a space in between the words cloud and shell, uh, nor with uh, a Cloud Shell product, which is sold on the AWS marketplace. Um, this is a browser-based shell um, that's accessible from your AWS console. Um, so we'll start up a, an Amazon Linux 2 uh, instance for you to... Uh, basically use a, use a shell um, in your browser with the IAM credentials that your console access had. So um, all of that set up for you in advance. Um, there's no cost to it. Um, so you, the, you're not sort of um, charged for doing this. The one thing that we've noticed that maybe uh, makes this slightly more limited than we were perhaps hoping is that um, that shell doesn't run in the VPC of yours. It's a, it's a completely sort of free floating thing. So I'd rather hope we might be able to sort of talk about this as a security model for, you know, um, 
the occasional shell access you need in your environments but that seems not to be the case but that might come in time um and uh, and certainly if you just need to quickly start a uh, uh, start a shell session to to press some buttons on the command line um then that might be a, a useful thing to add to your arsenal um so pretty interesting stuff um where do we go from here? Well, I think if I were you, um, so I guess we, we work with a lot of customers and many of them look sort of the same in terms of how they use the cloud. Um, and so I think this is what I would be doing if I were those customers, um, you know, notwithstanding all the important product stuff that you have to do. Um, I would probably go and enable DevOps Guru straight away. Um, there seems to be no reason not to do that. Um, and I think that will give you um, insight pretty quickly. Uh, I would consider converting my GP2 to GP3 volumes um, where I'm using those uh, to see if I could save some money on that and do those one at a time uh, so as not to impact on my uh, my platform performance. But uh, uh, there doesn't seem to be any reason not to do that. Um, I'd definitely be in the sort of medium term thinking about can I try my app on Graviton? Does my software work on an ARM environment? Uh, because that 40% uh, price performance saving seems too good to be uh, to be missed. Um, and certainly um, there are other opportunities for you to save um, in terms of Graviton because many of the AWS services like RDS and Elasticsearch and so forth, uh, you can choose Graviton-based instances for that. <clears throat> so you might be able to sort of very easily reduce a bit of cost in, in, in that landscape. Uh, just by uh, by switching those instance types, uh, I would if I was running uh, Prometheus and Grafana today, I'd, I'd adopt the managed service versions of those. Um, likewise, the uh, Active MQ and Rabbit MQ stuff, um, and I'd probably look at my uh, delivery model for um, for Lambda and see whether or not uh, I could. Uh, use the container uh, image management instead uh, just to to make consistent um the um the way that i'm i'm building all of my all of my parts of my application um so that's what i've been looking at um obviously if you're uh, ml focused there's a bunch of stuff that you can get into um obviously some of this might not apply to you if you don't want to save money or you're, you're too busy building features or whatever it's always worth understanding the trade-offs that like you know your your, your cost savings uh might be dwarfed by the manpower cost of actually making those changes so uh take the take the usual sort of um approach of uh, of costing it out but uh, i would certainly uh do those things if uh, if i were running a production infrastructure right now which uh, i don't because my job is webinars and spreadsheets these days um so that is um my recap of uh, of reinvent um I've got Paul and Marco uh, on the line uh, with us as well in case uh, anybody has questions that we can answer. Um, I will uh, stop sharing my screen. Um, if uh, if anybody would like to um, uh, pitch in questions or, or ask for clarification about you know, any of the things we've talked about today, then then please do. Um, we'll give that a few minutes. And if, uh, if there is no uh, further questions, then we will wrap up. So um, thanks for joining. Um, it's, uh, it's great to see your names in a list i guess rather than your faces um but uh we hope you'll uh, hope you find it useful i hope you have a, a good christmas as well so um we will stick around for five minutes and, and see if there are questions to answer uh, otherwise thanks very much we'll see you again Personally, I think the thing that excite me, excited me the most is the uh, Cloud Shell announcement until I saw that it's not in the VPC. But you can right. guarantee at some point soon that will get added on. And I think yeah. that's when that will become super useful. I'd like to really, see that. Yeah, Lit Really handy. I'm sure it asking, will appear. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Leonardo is asking, can a Cloud Shell be a replacement for a Bassin host? So no, not it can't because the um, uh, the the shell itself runs entirely outside of your own VPC environment. If you want to use something like that, then uh, SSM uh, Session Manager will provide a mechanism by which you can execute commands um, behind your firewall, essentially using uh, using Amazon APIs. Uh, but there are some limitations. So I, am I right in thinking that's not a you don't get a PTY? It's not a proper interactive shell, or, or did that get changed? Uh, you you can tunnel over it as well now, so you can actually pipe anything over it. The performance right. isn't fantastic. Um, so if you've got any high bandwidth requirements, then it's not a suitable replacement. But if you're just doing maybe connecting to a database, SQL queries, like low traffic, low bandwidth like that, then it's, it works pretty well. Um, mm -hmm. And I, 
like like I said, I suspect uh, the cloud shell will get VPC at some point, um, and mm -hmm. so it could be used for intermittent access, but it wouldn't be a replacement like for a full time Bastion host. Yeah, yeah. I guess I can see a, a world where maybe you you use cloud shell to connect to the SSM session manager. Um, and th thereby giving yourself a security position where you can say the only access to things behind the firewall comes from the cloud shell. So there's like yeah. a you're you're yeah. not able then to exfil data over that over that link because you're just connecting to a shell through a browser, and that might be a might be a fairly compelling security story. Yeah, session manager is quite cool because then you can have everything in private subnets. You don't have to have anything exposed publicly, and you can still get access to them through the session manager. So if if people haven't checked it out. It's it's really cool. It's definitely worth having a, having a play with, and it's it's pretty easy to set up as well. It's not too difficult. But if you get stuck, give us a shout, and we can yeah. give you some pointers. Uh, it does offer the similar functionality as well, actually. So you can either you know spawn it all locally from your console or via the AWS console as well. So it does give you a nice GUI uh, in a similar way that uh, AWS Shell does. So um, yeah. Cool. Uh, maybe just worth mentioning as well for the for the hosted services for as Prometheus and mm. Grafana, they're still in preview. So if you're yep. thinking of using that in production, uh, might be careful about that, but they should hit GA, I think in Q1 at least. So should be there. Yeah, and th those have been built by, like the Grafana one has definitely been built by Grafana Labs, right? Yeah. And, and, I, and I have a feeling the Prometheus uh, implementation is based on Cortex, which is also a Grafana Labs product, or it's from Weaveworks. I can't remember that there are sort of two two similar things, which is essentially um, Cort Cortex and the other one whose name I forgot um, provides a, a Prometheus API interface, um, but delivers its data <clears throat> into um, things like S3. So you're not actually running a Prometheus time series database. It is um, which means that you can store your data for longer. I think Prometheus, you would typically age things out after 30 days or something like that, whereas um, Cortex allows you to um, to basically age out things after 30 days into a, a backing store that you can still then query using the Prometheus API. So um, really useful when, you're, when you kind of want to go. Is that what happened in Black Friday last year? You otherwise don't get that, that data kept. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that's a, that's a great win, actually, yeah having it hosted and just <clears throat> delegate all the pain away of, you know, managing it. Yeah. I think of uh, all the announcements, the one that is um, really the no brainer for me is the GP2 to GP3 migration, because mm. you can do it live. Yes. Don't do it if you're under a massive load, but you, you can do it live. You don't have to take anything down. 20% cost reduction done. Yeah, and, and possibly <laughs> more than that if you can reduce that. I mean, obviously you can't shrink volume easily, but yeah. um, if you have over provision for IOPS, then uh, reducing that is probably going to help. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing that in RDS. Like I feel like a lot of the conversations we have about sort of trade-offs of IOPS and, and sizes in the RDS realm rather than in yeah. sort of EBS. So um, once that makes it there, I think that's going to be a much more uh, much more compelling story. Um, maybe uh, maybe go over to a Graviton two uh, RDS instance as you go as well, um, and see what see what happens there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, when talking about exciting stuff, uh, I'm actually quite excited about getting uh, a new functionality to do the EKS console as well. So it will give you much more insights of what you're running in your uh, in your worker nodes, whereas Nowadays, it's just showing you, you know, it's up and running certificates, configuration files, rather you don't have the really kind of deep insights of what kind of workloads you're running. So that's kind right. of right. So you, you would, I guess that would pre, uh, replace the Kubernetes dashboard that you might otherwise install as a Kubernetes yeah. component. Exactly. Uh, stuff. Uh, cool. Well, there are no further questions from the uh, from the room. Um, so, in which case, uh, thanks for joining, everyone. Um, have a great Christmas. Um, do uh, get in touch if there's anything we can help you with in the new year. Uh, in particular, if you are uh, in the in the SaaS world and you are uh, looking at things like security and compliance, those are areas that we are doing a lot more work in recently. Uh, we can definitely definitely help you out in that in that way. So, um, thanks very much. We'll see you again soon. Cool. Thanks. See ya.